Turn to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 17. I made a mistake and I put a cough drop in my mouth. Now I gotta crunch it down quick so it can gunk my teeth up so I can be picking at it for the next 20 minutes. Breathe. Breathe. <laughs> First Samuel 17 seems to be, in my mind, just a very familiar passage. It's one of my favorite places in the Bible. I never used to have favorite places, but this is becoming one of them. First Samuel 17 and Gideon, I think, is one of my other passages that I love. And this, um, the first Samuel 17 is, it, it just seems so familiar with uh, the times I've heard it in Sunday school, times that I've gone to any kind of VBS or day camps. Uh, this is just one of the stories that's always taught, always preached, always given as examples for how a young lad can serve the Lord. And how do we know he's young? Because in verse 56, it calls him a stripling or a stripling. And that means an, uh, an adolescent, a teenager. So this man, this David, this young, young man at 16, 15, 16, 17 years old, uh, defeated this Goliath. And Goliath is uh, somewhere around nine foot nine, and he's fully capable. He's not, a, he's not a, uh, a giant in our times that would be that age that can't function, that needs the ankle braces and things like that. No, this guy could fight. He had the power of a devil behind him. And, and he could fight, and little David, we call him, little David came along and, and, and took him out. And he took him out and using that sling and that stone, and that reminds me of that song we sing in our little hymnal. That's one of my favorites. I'll sing to that with the kids. And only a boy named David, only a rippling brook, only a boy named David, five little stones he took. Only a boy named David, only a... What do you mean I messed it up? <laughs> little sling... Only boy David, but he could pray and sing. What do you mean I messed it up? I'll talk to you later. <laughs> and one of the stones went into the sling, and the sling went round and round, and one of the stones went into the sling, and the sling went round and round, and one of the stones went into the sling, and the sling went round and round, and round and round and round and round and round and round and round. Did I get to that point already? The, oh, is that, am I already there? Did I already go up? One of the stones went up in the air, and the giant came tumbling I, I, I love singing that one. I love singing that one with the kids, making the big giant, making the big tall. <clears throat> and I just love the story. It's a fun story. This is, there's not much better when you come against uncomprehensible, unconquerable odds, and you are the little man, and you beat him. I mean, we are, we are little man in America versus corporate America in the big, bad, yeah. whatever. And... <laughs> And we win. Amen. That's what this story is all about. Chris is nothing about that at all whatsoever. It's about trusting the Lord. And it's about facing down your giants. And it's about if the giants come to face down your church or face down your family or face down you personally, it's you, you're going to take a stand and you're going to fight them. That's what this story is about. And so we'll, we'll, we'll close this out here. We'll come down to chapter 17. We'll finish out the chapter or, or some verses from the end. And uh, they, have, um, they have some some name-calling each other in verses 41 to 47 uh, around those verses. And in verse, verse 48, it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it. It's the only slang word in the Bible right there. Only one time, only time it uses, slang word in the Bible. And slang it, smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. And David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. When the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. Um, yeah, let's pray. God, thank you for this morning, and Father, help me to preach this word and the sermon best I can. And Father, where I fail, I pray you would make the difference up, and where I do things right, I pray that you would make the difference up, Father. And Father, may this be all about you, and may we praise you and glorify you, and Lord, I love you. In Jesus Christ's name I pray, amen. It's 1 Samuel 17, so here's David. I, I didn't know this until I looked it up, but uh, maybe I'm even mistaken, but David seems to me to be the most used name in the Bible outside of God. I guess God's the most used name. God, Jehovah, Lord God. 
I guess those are pretty, those are well and above in the six, seven thousand times. But the name David, David's used more than Jesus Christ is used, or Jesus is used in the Bible. I didn't look up Christ, but I thought Jesus was in there more than Christ. Uh, David is used more than Moses, used more than Abraham. David's a pretty important man in the Bible, is what I'm pointing at. And you have somewhere around 1,139 times that you can find the name David in the Bible. He's an important man in the Bible, amen? Every king in the Bible, every king in the Bible, they were always measured up to the standard. How did they fare? How did they line up with the king, David? Did they do good and follow David? Or did they do bad and not follow David? Every single one lined up against him. And we will too, because David's a type of Jesus Christ. Uh, but I want to point out here, uh, we're going to go back to chapter 16. I want to point out how David got to this. This was not just a, a battle that, uh, that David was flung into the midst of with no preparation. And I want to point out, I want you to realize that if David had not, had, or had not been who he was at this point in life, that he would not have been able to fight this Goliath. And if David was not who he was and, and what he was and as prepared as he was, things would have gone or could have gone quite a bit differently. In this battle, this David, his preparation starts out in chapter 16, and we have verse 1, The Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil, and go, I will send thee the Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. Now, this doesn't mention David, but we're introduced to the idea of David in this chapter. We're introduced to David, the need for David even. We're introduced to his need by, by seeing how other men have failed and haven't held up the gap and stood and made up the hedge as there needed to be. Uh, David was called out by the Lord because Saul didn't fulfill his role. Not only Saul, but Samuel. If you were to look over here, I think it's around chapter 8, 1, Kings, or, I'm sorry, 1 Samuel chapter 8. I believe it's around there. It says in 1 Samuel chapter 8, and it says in verse 1, this is before the king uh, Saul was, a, was anointed, before the men said we wanted a king, actually in this chapter is where it happens. And it starts off, it says, And it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. That was before the kings. That was just the next progression. Samuel was a judge. That's how they reigned. Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel, Judges. They reigned by judges. That's how God took care of Israel, was by these judges. And the next progression was Samuel's sons. Samuel was an awesome man. He was a man chosen from, from the belly, basically, to serve the Lord. And God worked with him and spoke to him when God would speak to no one else. No one else was doing right, but Samuel was. And God chose Samuel and used him. And as Samuel grew old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of the firstborn was Joel. The name of the second, Abiah. They were judges in Beersheba. But, and his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre and took bribes and perverted judgment. And therefore, the men of Israel, off the backs of that, said, We want a king. We don't want your sons ruling over us. So as we go into 1 Samuel 16 and we're introduced to, Sam, uh, to David... We're, we're, way, we're made aware of the failure of the other men around him. And one was Samuel. Not Samuel himself per se, but his sons. And I know every child that is going to do right, and I don't know how much blame to put on the man Samuel because uh, everyone makes their own decisions as they grow up. And you can, you can teach and do right or as, as what you say, but your children are going to make their own decisions. So I don't know how much blame to place on Samuel, uh, I, I certainly can say that he did not do everything right because no man does. But uh, his Samuel did not make it. His judges did not, his sons did not continue the line of the judges. Saul was chosen. By whom? Whom chose, who chose Saul? <laughs> the people chose, said we wanted a king. Who picked out Saul? And so here's a man, seven foot, seven-ish. He's head and shoulders above everyone else, so what is that, about 10 inches, a foot, about a foot taller than everyone else, average, average height, about six foot, say, so he was seven. Unless you're that guy over there, you might have a little bit more of a head and shoulders. Seven foot, seven foot six. I mean, there's, for a, for a guy who's only 
six foot to, to nine foot nine. I mean, if you're that tall and nine foot nine, that's only, you know, that's not that big of a difference. <laughs> but Saul didn't do right either, did he? And Saul dropped the boat. And here we have these men failing. He says, how long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? If go fill thine horn with oil and go, and uh, I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. He had Saul. Saul was his choice-ish. Saul could have been his choice if he continued on. How can I go? Oh, come on down here, verse 6. It came to pass when, I, when, when they were come, so... Sorry, Jesse, uh, Samuel comes to Jesse the Bethlehemite, and he calls his uh, seven kids in front of him. He says, and when they, came, when they were come, that he looked, Samuel looked upon Eliab and said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. So here, this is how we're introduced to David. We're introduced to David through Samuel failing the judges, through Saul failing being a king, and from Eliab, his oldest brother, being presented to him, and Samuel, who's, I guess, not that great a judge of character, I don't, I don't want to criticize Samuel. He's one of the heroes in the Bible. But Samuel, as any man would, he just says, oh, here's a, here's a nice young man. He's strong. He's healthy. He's active. He's got, he was respectful. He called me sir. He called me uh, seer, not prophet. He used the old term, you know. And, he, and here's a man that he does everything right. This Surely the Lord's with him. And God says, uh, 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 Samuel, Samuel, the Lord looketh not on the outward appearance. Verse 7. Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord looketh not as, seeth not as man seeth. I, I praise the Lord. The Lord seeth not as man seeth. Man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Eliab. Now, Eliab, he was a danger. Eliab, as we go into the next chapter, he, he had a problem with David. <laughs> Eliab was not a good man for the kingship because he had, he had a problem right here with his heart. And the whole point of my sermon this morning is I want to preach about the heart. And I'm going to get to David. What does the Bible say about David? The Bible says about David that God chose David, who was a man after his own heart. The Bible says about David, as we get on down here in verses 8 and 9, <clears throat> verse 10 Verse 11 it says, He said, There remaineth yet the youngest. Behold, he keepeth the sheep. So man thought that because here's just the, the little one, the young one, he is worthless. That man thought that David didn't have any value, no reason to bring him out from keeping the sheep because he's, he's no good. He's only just a young boy. He, surely he's not the one. And I'm glad that, again, God seeth. Not as man seeth, that when you get to where you're thinking that you're just a nobody, just remind yourself of who David was. David was a nobody. But the point was the heart. The point was the heart. The Lord, back verse 7, I have refused him. Why? Because Eliab had a problem with anger. Eliab was self-willed and self-opinioned. Eliab was Dave, critical of David and ready to exalt himself. And Eliab acted more spiritual outwardly than he actually was inwardly. And what does it say? I have refused him, for the Lord seeth not as man seeth. What does the Lord see? Man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. And if you're here saying the Lord will never use you, you've got to start with your heart. How is your heart before the Lord? The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. The Bible says, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Proverbs, Proverbs 23 says, My son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. The foundational issue, why David was able to stand before Goliath in 1 Samuel 17, was that he had a heart for the Lord. We go on down here to verse 11. He says, Are there all thy children? He says, there remaineth the youngest, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, send and fetch him, for we will not sit down until he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. He was ruddy with all of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. You would say, well, that's good, right? Well, ruddy and with all of a beautiful countenance. Look over, hold your pace here, but look over in chapter 17. And 
Look down here towards the end of the chapter in verse 42. It says, The Philistine, the Goliath, looked about and saw David. He disdained him, for he was but a youth and what? Ruddy <laughs> and of a fair countenance. So you say, Ruddy's good, right? I'm not saying it's bad, but that's what the giant disdained him for. Because uh, I, I guess... I guess people have looked at other pe preachers, for example, or, or Christians that have grown up, got saved young, and dedicated their lives to serving the Lord and just never went out to live in the world. There's a few of them in the world. There's a few of them like that. In the, that's not a good thing to say. There's a few of them in the world. There's a fair of them here. <laughs> and, you know, I, I've heard older men that maybe they got saved later in life that did some of the the partying and the drugs and the alcohol and just hard living. And I've heard them say about other men, says, yeah, he's never drunk anything harder than milk sop. Amen. Amen. I guess that was David. He just had that ruddy appearance. Ruddy means healthy. It means reddish. But it, this is what Goliath made fun of him for. So you might think that this is good here, but, but if you're going to go fight in a fight and you're going to go stand before Goliath, it, it's actually not a good thing. It's going to be used against you because this guy doesn't have any experience. <laughs> so again, I'm not looking at the outward appearance. It didn't matter what he was. I'm, God threw these in here to make a comparison to himself, to Jesus Christ, is what he did. He's of a beautiful, and, and the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. And the Bible says about David, it says that uh, in, in Acts chapter I know I have that verse here. Uh, I'm not seeing it, but it's uh, Acts chapter 2. Um, hmm. Oh, it's Acts 13, 22. I do have it. It says, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, who shall fulfill all my will. That's what the Lord said about David. So David's issue here was that he had a heart that was ready to serve the Lord. But I want to point out, we want to point out that God was involved with this, for one. Because it was God who sent Samuel over to this family. And by the way, let's even back up further than that. It was, it was God that came down in, into uh, Bethlehem when Elimelech and his sons left the city of Bethlehem to go flee over into a foreign country. And when God had them marry the, no, uh, Naomi, excuse me, Ruth and uh, the other girl's name, What's her name? Is this, what is it? Orpah. Orpah and Ruth. And God had, took those two boys home, and Orpah and Ruth were left as widows, and they came to Naomi, and Naomi says, I'm going to go home because everything's just bitter here, and I hear there's bread down in Bethlehem, and she goes back to the house, and, and Orpah and Ruth follow her, and God tells, or, or, or Naomi tells them, says, go home, I can't provide for you, and Orpah goes home. But Ruth, she gave Naomi her whole heart. And there's something I've, I've learned personally in my life is that if you're going to be involved in something, you need to give it your whole heart. <laughs> you can't be part in. There's been times I've been around my own family, my, my brothers and my sisters and my mom and dad, and I've been thinking about something else and and my heart was not in there, and I was offended at something that they said. <laughs> or some way they reacted. And I came down, and we only get together a couple times a year, and so you want it to be good, you know. But I didn't, I was held back because my heart was not into my family, and guess what happened? More strife, more conflict, more bad. It, we just, we never could click together because somebody was hindering it. And it's not till you get off the road a couple miles down the way and you start to think about it and say, you know, the problem wasn't with them ever. It's always been with me, my heart. Ruth, she had given her heart to Naomi. They went home. And what, did, what happened? God. God put Ruth into the field of, did I mention the wrong, king, the wrong man's name at the beginning? No. Bo, God put Ruth in the field of Boaz. 
And God put favor between those two. And, and God set it up so that Boaz married this, uh, uh, this woman, Ruth, who was, by the way, virtuous. And they married, and God said that, uh, God didn't say, but God blessed them and brought children up to them. And, and Obed begat, I'm sorry, Boaz begat Obed. And Obed begat Jesse. And Jesse begat David. Why? Because we're starting back with great, great grandma who she gave her heart to her mother-in-law, gave her heart to the God of Jacob and got plugged in. That's who David is. That was his background. That was his, um, that's what I'm looking for here. That was his heritage, and that's who David became. David, as we see here in chapter 16, God comes along. God anoints him. He sees David. God picked David because Dave, God knew David. But then later on, look, look and see the next thing in verse 14. The spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And the servant said, Behold, uh, let's, let our Lord now command which our servants which are before thee to seek out a man who is a cunning player on an harp. <laughs> and who'd they choose? David. And David gets introduced to Saul. And you know what David does with Saul? Takes his heart and he lays it down at his feet. And man, you're going to see the next, I don't know, 10, 20 years where David begins to serve Saul faithfully. David makes a name for himself, but he does it all in the name of Saul. Saul says, Saul begins to get envious and he wants to kill David. And he says, I'll kill him because he wants to marry one of my daughters. So, hey, I'm going to give him an impossible task. Go kill a hundred uh, uh, Philistines and circumcise them and bring me their foreskin. And that's awful. <laughs> and David says, who am I that I should be the son of a king? He'd given him his heart even when he deceived him. He said he was going to give him his oldest daughter, <coughs> Merib. And he deceived him and then gave him, settled for a second best with M Michal, I call her Michal, to know that it's feminine because it's not Michael, it's Michal. <coughs> and then they go on down the road and he, and, and he tries to kill him with a javelin twice and he escapes out of his hand and he flees from him and he gets in a position two times where the Lord provided him an opportunity to kill him where David could take the problem out and David could be the pro set up in the proper place to where he was and he refuses and he says, who am I to touch the Lord's anointed? His heart was still with him. He gave him his heart. The problem was never with David. It was always with Saul. And down to the very end, when Saul is killed at the end of chapter, uh, at the end of the book in 1 Samuel chapter 24, and when Samuel is or excuse me, when Saul and Jonathan are killed, and, 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 and David weeps and cries, and he says, oh, how the mighty are fallen, Saul and Jonathan. Up to the very end, he had given him his heart when one of those, uh, what was it, a Moabite or an Ammonite came to David and tried to deceive him and say, Tried to earn favor by tricking him and saying, look, here's the things I took from Saul. How did he die? I killed him. He was already dying, but I killed him. <laughs> he rejected, he, re, he, re, he regretted that. <laughs> David, in everything he did, he gave it his heart. Amen. He wasn't in always. It wasn't always in an ideal, perfect places that he was in. He started off keeping the sheep. What did he do when he kept the sheep? He was respectful. He was purposeful. He took care of them. He did his best with it. <clears throat> How do we know that? Well, chapter 17, verse 12, David, the son of the Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, he had eight sons. The man went among, among, the man went among, went among men for an old man. Somebody figure out what that means and tell me. In the days of Saul, and the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to the battle. The names of the three sons went to the battle where Eliab, the firstborn, next to him, Abinadab, and the third Shammah. And David was the youngest, and the three eldest followed Saul. But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. That is probably not where he wanted to be. You know what young men want to do when there's a fight going on? 
I can't tell you how many testimonies of soldiers I've read when 9-11, for example, happened. Every single one of them wanted to go. And how many men signed up for the military because, hey, we're going to fight. <laughs> when there's a fight against you and your family and your household, guess what you want to do? You're going to get in it. You think he wanted to be keeping the sheep? No, but he's got a heart. You see two things throughout this whole story of David. You see the hidden hand of God, and you see the humble heart of David. When he's keeping the sheep, what does he do? Does he just, you know, ah, I'm going to do a a shoddy job? No, he does his best. We'll see. Jesse said, uh, verse 17, unto David his son, take now for thy brethren an ephah for this parched corn and these ten loaves, and run to the camp of thy brethren, carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of their thousand, and look how thy brethren fare, and take their pledge. And, and, and verse 20, And David rose up early in the morning, and what did he do with the sheep? He left them with a keeper. He didn't abandon them. He never ignored them. He didn't reject them. As a matter of fact, when we know the story down in verses 32, 33, and 34, when David stands before King Saul, we read the story of how David was given the charge of keeping his father's sheep. And when he had a, uh, the impossible task of protecting them from a lion that came, how many other shepherds would have just said, oh, sorry, father, I lost a sheep. Because it's just a sheep is just money. Not to David. His heart was given to the sheep. (laughs) And then a bear, the humble heart of David. Not only David did he give himself to the sheep, but why why did Saul choose David to come and play the harp before him? What does it say in chapter 16? Verse 17, it says, Seek out a man who is a cunning player on an harp. Why did they choose David? Verse 17, Provide me now a man that can play well. (laughs) Why did they choose David? He was good. I don't like the harp. I don't like the sound of it, sorry. But he did. He liked it. It was good. He put his heart into playing the harp. And he got good at it. Man, you know, there's, there's Christians that say you shouldn't do that because you're just going to make it a show. You're just going to make it a performance. <laughs> that blows my mind. People think that way. It actually is the other way around. The more you practice it, the less you, you have to think about what you're doing and the more you can glorify God with it. Huh. David put his heart into it. You see why he got, when he came up to Goliath in chapter 17, that the foundation was all there. He had God choose him because his heart was ready. It's all about the heart here. His heart was given to his father. It was given to the sheep. It was given to the practice. And then when he shows up, let's look at chapter 17. Then when he shows up, There's a war. (laughs) And I want to see God's hand again. There's always God's hand throughout this. God's hand that works with the humble heart of David. Look at verse 1. I'm telling you the story of of David and Goliath. It's so familiar to me. (laughs) I can read it blindfolded, it seems like. And yet the last three times I've read it through, it was God gave me another little bit. And then another little bit. I said, God, are you adding words to this passage? They weren't there. There was nothing that interesting in that passage before. And then there's another one. And then there's and then just a couple days ago, as I was thinking about it, there was three of them just like that. I said, Lord, do you know what you're doing? You know. (laughs) The Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shoka, which belongeth to who? Who put that battle there? Judah. Okay, Judah. David was from which tribe? Judah. If that fight was in any other tribe, in any other location, guess who probably wouldn't have been sent to go feed his brothers? Because it was just around the hill. Who did that? God did that. The 
Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together. They pitched by the valley of Elah, set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on one side, and Israel stood on the other side of the mountain. They ran out a champion, Goliath. Verse 8, And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine? And ye servants to Saul, can you hear the mocking in this? Your big king Saul, your champion, he's mocking him. And why is Saul not coming out? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. And if ye be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants? If I prevail against him and kill him, then ye shall be our servants and serve us. I, I want to think, I think about that, that uh, we, you are going to have enemies in this life. And the, the world position is just to be neutral, but you just cannot, there's certain, with certain people, you cannot be neutral with them. I just read uh, missionary Chris Rue, my friend. He wrote a prayer letter, and of course about the time when we were over in Ukraine and we stopped at a man's house that... Uh, we visited certain villages that were under Russian occupation, and, and this man and woman, like many of them, they, they stayed at home, and they said, I'm not here to fight anybody. I'm not going to fight them. I'm not fighting them. I just want to live on my farm. And the Russians came through and took it over, and the Ukrainians came back to fight it, and this particular family, had a, had a, they, they had to hide in their for, for days at a time to, to, to live. And at one moment, at one time, a, a rocket landed about 20 feet from their house, blew off their gate, shrapneled into their house. The heat from it melted parts of their uh, fence. And he showed it to us, the rocket. This is what landed right there. <laughs> He showed us little handfuls of these uh, there's a flechettes, I guess is what they're called, flechettes. Where these rockets will come land and they'll have they'll be they'll be filled with thousands of these little metal nails ish, shrapnel. And when they land, they spread out. And any one of those could kill you or hurt you or they could, they do damage. And he showed us handfuls of them. And he showed us pictures of how this bomb landed there and that one there and that one there and we've just been cleaning up. Cleaning up, cleaning up. And he says one time he's, they, want, they, they needed to call somebody, so his wife climbed up on the top of the house to try to get a signal. And when she climbed up there, there was a sniper that took a shot at her, and the bullet grazed her head. And I guess that was the final moment. And they said, I guess our, this just ain't that important. But that man sought neutrality. And there's certain men that you just cannot be neutral with them. What is Goliath saying here? If you kill us, we'll be your servants. If, you, if, you, if we kill, he's lying. How do I know that? Because they beat him. And did they become his servants? No, they fled and ran. Liars. That's the people you're going to deal with on this earth. Don't let that be you. Don't let that be you. You, be, you take the high moral road. <laughs> you do what's right. We read on down here, it says, David comes in in verse 12, 13, 14, all the way down, 20. It says, in verse 22, David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage. I never saw that before. Ran into the army and came and saluted his brother. And as he was talking... With them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words. And David heard them, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. Now, I'm, I just, my mind works, and I, I read a passage of Scripture, and it just works on it. And a couple years back, I was working on this passage, and I just, my brain could not figure out why King Saul chose David to be their champion to go out and fight Goliath. I said, that makes absolutely zero sense to me that they would put this boy who has no battle experience out to go fight Goliath. And my brain worked it out, and my brain says it was a bait. They were both up on the sides of the mountains. They were both in a stronghold position. And they wanted one of them, so they wanted to send out a sacrificial lamb, and so that lamb would die, and so the Philistines would come off their mountain, 
And then they could bait him and trap him and go kill him. I said, man, that's a great plan. I'm glad that was God. God, that was good. I'm glad you gave that to me. <laughs> and then I start reading the passage and I start saying, I don't think that was it at all. Because here's another thing I never noticed before. It says, all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, they fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of, men of Israel said, have you seen this man that has come up surely to defy Israel? Is he come up, and it shall be that the man who killeth him, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the men of Israel are terrified. They ain't making plans. They're terrified. They're shaking in their boots. <laughs> David spake to the men that stood by him, what shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine? Taketh away the reproach from Israel for David. David is not talking like the Israelites. David says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Verse 28, Eliab. This is why God didn't choose Eliab. Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why camest thou down hither? With whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart. For thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. You know what this is? This is the devil right here. The devil's a sly beast, isn't he? I said there's some you can't live peaceably with. He's one of them. He's actually the one. And he's so sly, he says he, says he uses his oldest brother, Eliab. The devil's so slick that, listen, where should the fight be? Here's the Philistine. He's challenging us. We're terrified in our boots. He's the one we should be giving our energy to. And here comes little David, and he's the one I get mad at. Why can't Israel destroy Goliath? Because <laughs> they're fighting petty battles. The devil's so slick, he'll make you focus on others and not on your enemies. He knows that if the devil's a, a very patient enemy. He knows if he can't get you today, he'll follow your heart down the road and he'll find a spot and he'll try again later. And if that fails, he'll follow your heart and he'll follow you down the road and he'll try again later. He's done it, for, he's done it throughout history. He did it to Abraham. Abraham was known for his faithfulness to God. And so he got him through fear. Moses was known for his meekness. And so the devil got him through his anger. David was known for his heart for the Lord. And David fell later in 2 Samuel chapter 11 because of his success. And if one way won't get you, the devil knows how it'll get you. Balaam fell because of popularity. Saul because of envy. John Mark because of homesickness. Samson because of lust. Barnabas because of dissension. Judas because of money. Solomon because of women. Job because of pride. Cain because of anger. Jacob greed. Eve vanity. Elijah discouragement. Esau weariness. The devil knows which one will get you. And if he can't get you to attack... Somebody directly, he'll get you to retaliate. If he can't get you to have a bad spirit, if he can't get you to have a bad spirit, he'll get you bitter against those that do. If he can't get you to sin, he'll get you to be self-righteous about not sinning. Hey, that was me. If he won't get you to be lazy, he'll get you to be so busy that you forget what the main thing is. If he can't get you to compromise, he'll get you to hate those that do. <laughs> if he can't get you to fail, he'll get you to rise up with a pride of success about you. He's patient. He's sly. That's what we see Eliab. Why is he getting mad at David? David's the only one taking a stand, believing in the Lord God. Why? His heart. His heart is given to the Lord. David said, what have I not done? Is there not a cause 
Israel's not talking that way. David's talking about that way. And I never know this verse 30. And you probably all have. He turned from him toward another and spake after the same manner. So here comes Eliab. And Eliam's making fun of him. And he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? How come we're not doing anything about it? Is there not a cause? And Eliam makes fun of him. He turns to the next soldier. He says, you guys hear what he said? How, how is that guy getting away with that? There's no reason he should be getting away with that. And he turns to the next one. And he says, are we not ready? Don't we have a plan? Is, how is this guy getting away with this when we have the God Jehovah on our side? And he goes to the next group. And he says, hey, we got something they don't. We got God. We should go out and face them. And he goes to the next group. And he's stirring up the army. So much it catches Saul's attention, and Saul gets called into David. David gets called into Saul. <laughs> and he gets put on the armor, and he can't do it. And he goes out there, and he gives a story, and he says, I can do it because I believe in God. And they're all shamed, and Saul puts him out there and says, we believe in you. Go do it. And Saul go, or David goes and does it. You ever heard that thing? These are the times that try men's souls. Thomas Paine, 1776. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of their country. When, you get, when I get reading these old timers, I have to change my brain because I'm not used to real English. I'm used to my chopped up version of it. <laughs> he that stands it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny like hell is not easily conquered, yet we have this consolation with us that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. What we obtain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. That's everybody in America right now. We've never earned anything that we have. It is dearness only that gives everything its value. I'm, I'm comparing that to Ukraine where people have lost everything and they're more open to following the Lord right now, just like they were under communism. Heaven knows how to put a proper price upon its goods, and it would be strange indeed if so celestial an article as freedom should not be highly rated. I want to ask you a question in closing here. If, if David didn't rise to the challenge, how do you think this battle would have ended? <laughs> probably, they'd probably still be out there challenging each other across the mountains. <laughs> Let me ask you this. Would it bother you if Goliath stood facing this church and there was not a David to be found. If the devil came to you, verse 42, when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him. If the devil came to you, would he find you friend or foe? Would he disdain or would he approve and compliment? In David's case, we have an example where he killed Goliath and yet down the road, the heart, it's all about the heart. The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked and needs to be checked every day. And down the road, years later, we have David standing before the sons of Goliath. And he lost it. He failed the challenge, and he had to have one of his younger men around him stand in the gap for him and save his life to succor that other giant as he came to kill him. It's by Bibanov, I think it was. Would it bother you? Where's the Davids? How's your heart? Is it wholly given to the Lord as David's was? God, thank you for this sermon. Thank you for this time this morning. And Lord, it's nothing if you don't work, and it's nothing if you don't speak 